Okay, we're back on the Judy with another guest. Today we have Sean Davis. Thanks for coming, mate. How you doing, fella? You alright? I'm alright. I'm alright. Um, you've had a good career. Yeah, it was alright. Ups lot, and downs. A lot of prem games. Downs. How many prem games did you play? I couldn't tell you how many prem games, uh, but it obviously spammed over. Well, I first made my debut in 1996. And you were 17. 17, yeah. So, and obviously I had to retire through injury, which was probably the biggest disappointment. But all in all, young kid from South London, come right. good, really. Playing for the local club. Is it Fulham? Yeah. But, well, Fulham or Chelsea. I, <laughs> my family were all Chelsea fans. So, but Fulham's not really a, a harmful subject to, to breach. You could play for either one. But yeah, no. Uh, Paid for Fulham for over ten years, probably not my one one of my biggest regret. But looking back, when you finish playing football, I'd like I would have said to my younger self, "Don't go to Tottenham, stay at Fulham, and be a one one club, one man." Looking back, I don't I don't have any regrets. But if I could change anything, that would that would probably be one of but, the biggest ones in my football career. Like, but you're not wrong for going to Tottenham. Like, a club like Tottenham back then, it's an established prem club. Probably the money was too good to turn down. Do you know what? I, Fulham actually offered me more. Oh, serious? Yeah, serious. I'll never forget. I went back to back to the cottage with Tottenham, and I, I got I got heck I got abused to be honest, which was funny because they were calling me greedy and all that. But Fulham actually offered me more money. The contract was bigger at Fulham, but at the time it felt like a lot of the other players were going. Van der Sar left, Steve Finnan left, Louis Zaha left. So I thought, do you know what? Shall I? Shall I? Shall I? And it, it wasn't a decision that I took lightly, to be yeah. honest, because I six months earlier I put in a transfer request to go to Everton, which didn't come off. I got injured at the time, and I thought, no, nah, I'm not doing that again. And then it come up, and it was, do I? Do I? Don't I? Yeah. And eventually, I decided to go. But obviously, looking back now, I wouldn't have gone for certain certain reasons, yes. which leave a bad taste in my mouth. It seems like you just fled a sinking ship. Do you know what? I felt that like I was going to a team that were going to fight for Champions League and, and and win stuff, which actually worked out. Tottenham obviously went on and they signed a lot of lot of players. Yeah. For instance, when I moved to Tottenham, I got signed by uh, Frank Arneson at the time, and Santini was the manager, the ex French manager. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, he got the sack after three months, and Martin Yo came into Cova, and then I got injured, and it just all fell apart. But the main reason I think it fell apart, I think at Tottenham was uh, my little girl was uh, premature. So she was okay. premature in uh, Chelsea and Westminster Hospital. And I was injured at the time. And I had kind of uh, butting heads with this, the staff at you know Tottenham and the hierarchy because they said, no, we want you to move up. And I'm saying, well, my situation's a bit different now. My little girl's 10 weeks premature. Yeah. I'm having to go to Chelsea and Westminster Hospital in the morning to then go to training to come back. I'm injured, kind of get a couple of days here and there yeah. off. And then me back then, I was kind of, I was a joker when I was growing up. I was always laughing and joking. But if someone annoyed me back then, my guard would go up and I just wouldn't so do it. I wouldn't cooperate. I'd just be, just go AWOL, do you know what I mean? And, and the relationship fell apart from then. And then obviously being injured and trying to get back in the team and, then they brought Edgar Davids, Michael Carrick, Jermaine Jennings in my position. So oh, yeah. it we'll kind of we'll told me the story. We'll it kind of told me, told me yeah. I'm not really wanted here anymore. Yeah, we'll get we'll get to um, the Tottenham time. But, um, let's get back to Fulham. So when you when you're 17, you signed you signed your pro deal, made your debut. What league were they in? They were in the bottom league. So it was it would have been League Three then. It was oh. it yeah League Three. It's League Two now. Isn't okay, it? Yeah. But it would have been League Three. But yeah, I, I, growing up, obviously. I played, obviously I'm from Clapham, so I played local Clapham Little League. Yes. And then from Clapham Little League, I went and played for a Sunday team called like Ziggy Juniors that had the likes of Julian Gray, Gary Alexander, Alan McLeod, Marcus Hesse. And these are all names that were players that were playing for like Arsenal, Wimbledon at the time. Okay. So I went on the trial for Wimbledon, was there for about a year, then got released, went to West Ham for six weeks, got released. And then only, obviously I then started playing at Batsy Sports Centre. Okay. Uh, and there was a lot of good players at Batsy at the time that were coming through. So Batsy Sports, I was just playing football to enjoy it. Then uh, the late uh, Ray Henry and a guy called Sonny, they said, oh, Uncle Sonny, I know. Yeah, Sonny, yeah. Everyone knows Sonny and Batsy. <laughs> like, he, he, he's, a, he's a guy that, you know, 
knows everyone, South London schools and all that, and gets trials for all the young kids from Battersea. So I, I eventually went on trial at Fulham and it nearly all went to pot because we had a trial on a Sunday. So there's about six of us from Battersea. He said, oh, let's meet up at Clapham Junction because you can get a train from Clapham Junction yeah, to, to your, I think it, no, it was oh, your okay. at the time. It was your, your West or your East, one of the two. Don't. And there were six of us. So I went to get the train and the train went running. So all looking at each other thinking, oh, wow, we can't miss this opportunity because yeah. we're all decent players. This could be our last opportunity. And then we thought, ah, oh, Sugar Ray's going to cuss us because we're late and we're not going to turn up. So we went, oh, why don't we get a cab? So we went, all right then, not thinking, get in the cab. So we're all, there's five of us sitting in a black cab. So we get to the A3 and I'm looking around thinking, I ain't got no money. Yeah, no one's got no money. I know he's not got no money. <laughs> I know he's not got no money. I know he's broker than me. So I'm thinking, <laughs> we're going to have to jump this cab black cab in the middle of nowhere how are we going to do this so eventually we tell the cab driver to park up near the i think it was like a sunday pub or something we all duck out run cross the road through the train station over the tracks down the other side into the changing room got into the changing room and i think the manager at the time was danny jackart he was he knew a lot of people from battersea he went oh you just made it in time get changed you, you're starting all five of you are starting is this for a game on a Sunday? Sunday for yeah. Fulham against, I can't remember who we were playing, to be honest. And it was like a big game because it was kind of putting yourself out there yeah. to see if like they were going to take you on. Yeah. So forget about the cab now. Obviously, get changed, walk out onto the pitch. As we're walking onto the pitch, the cabman's run on, on to, like running across, like straight at us, <laughs> using language that I don't like to use. You, okay. C U N T and all that. And I'm thinking, Oh my God, we're finished. We're done. But Alan Cork, I don't know if you know, Alan Cork, big in the game, he was assistant manager for the first team. He was taking the game. So he's pulled the cab driver aside, obviously explained the situation and slipped him 50 quid to pay for the cab. We're thinking we're not even going to play the game. We actually don't carry on with the game. We played the game. After the game, we all come back in and everyone got released. Apart from me. Wow. So I was like, wow. Did you... I played well in that game. Oh yeah, I was trying to yeah, say, I but, it, I but did your it. boys not play well or is it just because the cabman you know singled I them out? I don't, see, that's a touchy subject. I I, I, I don't know. I, like I say, I, yeah, a few of them didn't play too great. One of them maybe could have got a chance. Uh, looking back at it now, I'm lucky that it went that way. But yeah, yeah it could have been all over before it began. But sacrifices you make for football, and it's just like coming from an area we come from. Uh, we've got to go out there to get signed. Like it's, yeah, it's hard, isn't it? It was hard going back to we went back to Batsy Sports Center. I think my my mate George was there as well, and we used to hang out together. And we went back to Sports Center. I'll never forget sitting in the office there, and you got Sonny Ray. I think Andrew Beadle might have been there as well, and they're just saying, "We sent you here, you." you bunked a taxi, you're, you're embarrassing, this is why, uh, and that kind of hit home. It was like, oh, wow, we've, we've got people who actually care about yeah. us here. We need to take this seriously. And I think that's when I first started to take football seriously because I was never really took it that serious, to be honest. Even when I got released from West Ham, my mum took me to Chadwell Heath, wherever it was in West Ham, and she was more upset when they released me than I was. Because okay. I was, I just, just loved, playing because you I just loved to play football yeah. with my mates, play with, but that was when, when we, when the ta after the taxi thing happened, that was when I was like, Do you know what, I need to take this seriously. Uh, so you're signed. What age did you get signed? We well, signed for the youth team at 16 oh, so years. Like youth team, yeah, scholarship. scholarship, two year scholarship, was 30, 34 quid a week. <laughs> <Or> a week. <laughs> yeah, blew my first pay packet, I think, on a pair of, pair of Moschino jeans or something <laughs> like that. Or Iceberg, one of the two. Um, so make it through the youth team, get to the first team, make your debut. And then you just go up, get promoted with them. Do you get all the way to the top? Yep. Uh, so made my debut in, in crazy, uh, not that I came off the bench when I was 17. So I think. What's it, that like at 17? It was weird because the day before we played for the reserves against Chelsea and I was a Chelsea fan at the time. And Rude Hullet and that was playing. And I was thinking. So you just in awe. Like. I, was, I was in awe. I remember <laughs> going to mark him and, and, you know when you go to close someone down, you kind of bend position. And I looked down and I saw the big Lotto tongue. And as I looked up, he's gone. 
it's five yards past me and I'm thinking, oh, that's the first time I've ever been starstruck. First time. And I played quite well in that game. We drew nil-nil yeah. uh, against Chelsea. So then got, we arrive at the first team game because we were used, so we had to clean. So we're cleaning in all the dressing rooms before, you know. Uh, then as soon as we finished cleaning the dressing rooms back then, you had to clean your pros boots that were playing. Uh, those days are gone now. So I'm cleaning the boots outside with uh, with a guy called Luke Cornwall, uh, Ryan Gray, and we were all close. And to be fair, right, they were all from Battersea as well, Simon, for them. Luke Cornwall was probably one of the best strikers at his age going round, but that's a different story. So I'm cleaning the boots now. Alan Court comes out and goes, Sean, Sean. And they, 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 they went to me, oh, what have you done now? Because I was always getting in trouble. Yeah. I went, no, no, I've done all my jobs. My jobs are done. He goes, are you not with these Muppets anymore? Give them the boots. They can clean them. So I threw the boots at them <laughs> as you do that. Like, threw the boots at them. Went into the change room thinking, why well, I'm coming to the change room. I'm sitting down like six, 17 year old kid. It's at Craven Cottage. Yeah, at Craven Cottage in a little change room. And then the, the manager names the team. Then he names the bench and I'm on the bench and I'm thinking, oh, what's going on? Like, so I didn't really this, understand it. At this point, have you trained with the first team? Or was it just still yeah, first team reserves? Not much, not much, but it was more. But we used to train side by side. And if they ever needed a, yeah. you know, we used to do training with the, the first team and we used to run with the first team in pre-season. So you know all the pros and it was quite... Back then, football was everyone was close. Everyone knew each other. Obviously, the senior pros used to take liberties with the younger pros yeah. and that. But I knew all of them. But they were more they were shocked, thinking, "Why? Why is he on the bench?" And then the manager turned around and went, "You're on the bench because Paul Brooker would normally be on the bench, yeah. and he was like a second year pro." And he went, "He's on the bench because he worked his nuts off in the game against Chelsea, and you didn't try a leg." And I'm just, I think it was to prove a point to okay. him to give him. A kick up the backside because yeah. he was a talented player, Paul Brooker for Fulham. A lot of Fulham fans would know him. He was a very talented player, but it was kind of to give him a kick up the ass. But obviously, I benef benefited from it. Yeah. So, but that was the only then that was the only time I played. That was it. What at seventeen? Uh, yeah, that season I travelled with this first team, like right at back end of the, when they won promotion. But I never ever played again. Oh, I didn't play again until I was. 19 so you've gone from here back down back down like without even anyone telling me why or why not but but obviously did... looking at that now it was because obviously i got put there to show him you need to buck your yeah. ideas up or i'm going to bring in another young kid how did it feel like being 17 on the bench for your sort of hometown club never really sunk in at the time because from then on i got called big time Oh. Big time Charlie. What, by your mates or by? By everyone in the club, like or the, <laughs> the pros. Not so much my guys that were in the first year apprentices, but then it was kind of anything I put foot wrong, oh, you think you're better than what you are because okay. you've been in the first team. So it was kind of a big burden on me. I was thinking, actually, wish I didn't do it now yeah. because you're calling me a big time Charlie. And the way I played didn't help back because my game changed. The progression of my game when I was younger – I was more skillful, nutmeg someone, like tricks, everything. But then as you get older, you work out to become a professional footballer. The manager, the manager needs to trust you. He needs to believe in you. You need to be able to take uh, take what he wants and then do it on the pitch. So yeah. that the skill and that kind of got brushed out of me. And I actually, I need to do this to get in the team. And then I ended up becoming a holding midfielder who's winning tackles and then giving, giving it. it do you know what I mean? So, yeah, that, that's how that kind of worked out. All right. So we jumped to your, your 19. You're now in what, League 1, 2? Yeah, League 1 or 2. Yeah, I think Kevin Keegan, Kevin Kill Keegan and Ray Wilkins came in. You're in the first team now, established. Yeah. How's that now? Uh, Still getting the big time Charlie shouts or? No, not so much. Because I played, uh, I played, uh, not, not whole. I think I played about 19, 20 times in League 1 on £150 a week. So it wasn't. For the money. Yeah, it wasn't for the money. Like when I was growing up, it's different. Nowadays, young players play football because they know there's money in it. When I played football, it wasn't for the money. You could yeah. earn more money doing bad stuff on the road when I was growing up. And most of the pals that I used to go to school with or some some of them that I grew up, they were all making much more money than me. And you're the only one playing football. And I was playing football. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So it was it was different back then. But I, I'd rather do it how I did it because I played football because I loved the game. 
And I play, I still play football now at 41 years of age because I love the game. I still watch football. If football's on, I watch it. Yeah. So nowadays the young kids get into it. And unless you really love or have passion for something, you're never going to go as far as you can go. That's what I believe. It's good, some good advice. Um, save that one to the end. Um, yeah. So you get pro all these promotions and you're, you make it to the Prem. What goes through your head then? The Prem was a bit surreal, to be honest. Obviously, I was a major part of the team that got promoted to the Prem, which made it easier for me to go into the Prem because I felt comfortable with my teammates. Uh, I felt comfortable with the manager at the time, uh, Jean Tigana. Uh, Mr. Toothpick. Yeah, he's a, he was a legend, to be fair. He, he was... he he. We had a love-hate relationship, but looking it back now, if a manager is always at you or always on you, it could only mean that he wants you to do good and wants you to do better. When you hear silence, that is not a good sign in football. If the manager don't talk to you or avoid you, that that is a bad sign. And looking back now, he was great. Because I remember when he first came into the club, I turned up late. And I was only like 19, 20 at the time. I turned up late and he went, he pulled me aside. He went, from now on, training is like, you have to get in at like 9.30, train at 10.30. Yeah. He went, from now on, you have to be in at training at 8.30, but you have to knock on my door and tell me you're in. I was like, what? I've done that for a month. Knock on the door like, Gaffer Amir. Boss. Yeah. And he used to be his toothpick. <laughs> and that was it. But I did it for a month. And then from then from then on, from the rest of my career, I always used to get in early. I was, yeah. it was just in tune in me, getting early, it's eat good, breakfast. Good little it's not life a hard life, is it? Like yeah. you get in, someone cook you breakfast, get a treatment from the physio, go in the gym, uh, chill out, have a laugh and a joke. Uh, but yeah, that was, that, that was, that was good help from him. Obviously, looking back now, it was good man and management from him. But then that made everything comfortable going in the Premier League with the same players. We only added a couple of players from the team that got promoted, and our first game was away at Man United. How was and that? We should have, we should, we should have, we should have won a game. I thought. I think Luis Sahar destroyed Yapstam, absolutely destroyed, and we played well. I think we were one 0 up after five minutes. Uh, then they got a couple of goals. Then we got an equaliser through Sahar again. And I'm sure they scored a jammy goal, but we came away from that game losing, thinking, "Yeah, we can hold our own yeah. in this league because we should have beat the ch we should have beat Man United." Who? Uh, yeah, listen, I'm playing against Veron, yeah. Skulls, Keane, Van Nistelrooy, Cole, like Andy Cole. I'm thinking, like, I'm mates with Andy Cole now. It was unbelievable. My mate when we was in uh, he used to go to Ernest Bevin uh, secondary well. school. Yeah, and my mate, I remember when he bought the Andy Cole Man United shirt, the yellow and green one, <laughs> and he put cold on the back. Yeah, and now I'm playing against, playing against him. him yeah. yeah, wow. But I know you said Rud Hull was the only time you were starstruck, but playing yeah. at Man United against these big names, yeah, like Premier League champions, weren't you thinking like, oh my no, God, I'm here. no, I was, I was going. Do you know what? I'm here now. Let's let's enjoy it. And I was I was so confident because we had we had a good team. We were like we destroyed the championship the year before. Yeah. I think you got 101 yeah, points or we, something. Yeah, we destroyed. It could have been a lot more, if, you know, if we would have maybe tried to go for it. You know, the last couple of games yeah. when you've won the title, won a promotion. If maybe a few of us would have stayed in a few more, few more nights <laughs> instead of enjoying enjoying the, uh, the the title. But yeah, I was I was confident. I, do you know what I mean? I just wanted to. I've never been. I've been Star Trek, but I've never been inferior of anyone playing football because at the end of the day, it's. It's just football. Yeah. The, the, the size five, it's a green pitch and it's got white goals. So that doesn't change. What, so what does affect players who play in the Prem? Like, is it the atmosphere? Is it the occasion? Like, what, like you just said, it's 11 humans against 11 humans, a size five ball, green pitch. So what yeah. are the differences? I think you get nervous. Don't get me wrong. You get nervous, but it's a, I think you, nerves are good. I don't know. In my career, there's been some players that it, it was weird. You can have some players that get called training ground players. They're unbelievable in training. When it comes to the game, they kind of don't do anything. And there's some players that are terrible in training when it comes to a match. That, like, for instance, when I was at Tottenham, Ledley King never used to train. Go out on a Saturday, he's the best player on the pitch. But they painted that as if because he was injured. He, yeah, he was injured and he, he couldn't train, but he'd still go out on a Saturday and be, and the, be best. the best player on the pitch whereas I got a similar injury to Ledley and the way I play I had to train the way I played so I could never train and get the fitness well, that, this is just for later on when they talk about my injury but it was just amazing how you could not train all week and then be the best player yeah. so 
certain players deal with certain things differently. For me, going into a game, I loved the crowd and all that. I loved the, you know, winning a tackle and the crowd yeah. celebrating or scoring a goal is probably the best feeling you can get in football. I didn't get many, but I've got some important got few, ones. Yeah. Got some important ones. Um England come knocking under twenty ones, quite made quite a few appearances for under twenty ones. And then the big boys. Yeah. Was you at Fulham when they come knocking? I was at Fulham, yeah. I ha hated it. Why? Hated that experience. Why? Oh mate. So I get called up to the England squads. Senior, it's a, it's a, it's a, it was the Australia game, uh, Upton Park. They lost it, but who was the manager? Uh, Ericsson was the manager. So they pick your car up, you go to, I think it was a hotel in Canary Wolf, get to Canary Wolf. But there was no real, like, what's the word? Like, it was all weird, like, no one really spoke. Team spirit weren't there. Yeah, and I'm looking around thinking, it's just me, it's my first England squad. No one really come up to me and said, oh, you know, Welcome. oh, yeah, yeah. So I'm thinking, this is like weird situations, Canary Wolf. So I actually went home, stayed at home and come back in the morning. I didn't stay in the hotel because you're rooming by yourself anyway. Yeah. Not that you're allowed to do that. But I was like, you know what? This is, this is long. Like, I'm not doing all. sitting in a room by myself. I went home, come back, went down for breakfast. All the southerners were on one side of the table, all the northerners on the other side of the table. No, there was... It, this is this not me being bitter, by yeah. the way. This is this is this is this how I saw it, and then we trained, but not everyone trained, and then the next day we done a little pattern of play. wasn't involved in that. It was twenty four players, I think. Three players didn't play. I think it was me, maybe Scott Parker and Matty Upson. I yeah. can't remember exactly, but then I remember after the game, like they lost three one. Come in, people just getting changed and going home. I don't, I don't even think I heard Ericsson say anything. So I just, all right, I'll get in the shower. Yeah. I went straight out. But you're not wrong with that because I think a lot of like reporters and people say that England's golden generation failed because there was a lot of Premier League tension that they brought into camp. And, yeah. you know, like you say, the Southerners sat with the Southerners, the Northerners sat with yeah. the Northerners. Like, it's very weird. I think as a manager, you've got to cut that out. And I had more, together. listen, like, all my family were there. I, I actually felt sorry for them because they travel all the way to Upton Park from South London. Yeah. And that's a, that's a bitch of a drive, yeah. to be honest. Uh, I had better time. Oh, I ended up going to a nightclub <laughs> after. I'm not even going to lie to you. I swear. I was, went out. I think I saw, I think I saw Crouchy, Peter Crouch or Ledley, or one of them anyway in a club that night. One of my pals, he used to uh, run clubs, a guy called uh, Safe, he used to do loads of clubs. I just went straight out. And then thought, oh, I'm gonna have a drink now. <laughs> we'll get we'll get to that. We'll get to that. Um, I think with every club, there is like a funny oh my god story. What was the oh my god story at Fulham before you left? Oh, there were some crazy, crazy, crazy times at Fulham. On a on a on a sad note, the oh my god story would have been when Chris Coleman crashed his car. That was wow, couldn't believe it. It was yeah. one of those things I'll never forget where I was. I was in Clapham Junction. Literally on the corner where Top Man used to be. Yeah. Cause I done I done a work experience in there. I lasted <laughs> one day. <laughs> but I'm walking and my sister rings me, Oh, have you seen the news? What did you Chris Collins had a car crash? That was like, oh wow. On that's that so on a serious note, that was a wow. Yeah. But there was loads. I remember uh for Fulham, there was a few, few like crazy things that used to go on. I remember we won the championship. And, uh, Go on, give us a night out. You won yeah, we won the championship and we flew to, uh, uh, where was it now? Uh, Flor Florida or something like that. Miami or somewhere like that. And we got off the plane thinking, yeah, we're just going to get on a piss now, drink bar. And the physio's got us in the swimming pool stretching off and all that. I was thinking, well, what's going on? <laughs> oh, you went as with the whole squad? The whole squad went out. We had well. a game planned. We played it. We played in a game against Columbus Crew or something like that. Yeah. Anyway, Carlos Valderrama was playing. Remember the guy with the oh, big yeah. afro? Yeah yeah. yeah. yeah, he was involved. But I remember thinking, now, so we, we'd done all that. We got back to the room. And I was I was room Barry Howes at the time. Me and Barry are quite close. And we're getting ready to go out and as we're coming out come out the lift a few of the lads walking back to us thinking oh, where are you going he went Christian Damiano assistant coach he's at the door he's not letting anyone out so we're like shit like, what are we going to do so we found the back entrance so me and him sneak out the back walk 60 yards down the road 
And when I mean 60 yards down the road, there was a place called Goldfinger, strip club. <laughs> Get in there. Let Two of the lads are already in there. Can't name their names, but they're already in there, uh, sitting in there. And then we think, and then after that closes, the woman who was in there, she went, ah, oh, take you to an English pub around the corner. So we all jumped in a yellow, bright yellow pickup truck. <laughs> so we're in the middle of nowhere now, driving to an English, getting this English pub, and four, four of the other lads are in there. So there's about 10 of us out now. Decent. Literally drank till early morning, come back, we had training the next day, we were all horrendous all horrendous wow. but yeah that that was a good trip to be fair i'll never forget because we used to then walk every day sneak out and walk past the starbucks to get to the strip club yeah and uh there was a goalkeeper called marcus hanneman yeah I remember american guy he's he's always sitting in there drinking coffee with uh tobacco up his mouth like, yeah no no it was like it was actually you know this snooze has got a bag but this yeah. is just pure tobacco oh, okay and he was american he used to wear cowboy <laughs> boots he was a proper like Late, like proper yeah. American, but every time we used to walk past past the Starbucks to go there, he'd be sitting in the Starbucks. Was he part of your team? Yeah, he was part of the team. Oh. We just waved to him and <laughs> wave back like that. Oh yeah, no, that was that, that was a, that was a good trip, very Indeed. good trip. So you get your move from Fulham to yeah. Tottenham. What was it for? I can't. I can't even remember the three, four million something like that. Wasn't. What's that? What's that feel like for a boy from where you come from? Yeah, to, to move from millions. Uh, at the time it wasn't as, um, it, it wasn't as bad because a lot of people were going for more. Yeah. So, but still. Yeah. Yeah. For me, it was like, wow. Like it was, a f a, it was all kind of a, a whirlwind how it happened to be honest. Uh, so yeah, it, it felt weird, very, very weird. And it was like, I was more concentrating on oh, where am I going to live? Cause I had the family at the time. Where am I going to live? My my, my miss my my ex at the time was uh, pregnant, uh, so it happened all kind of quick. But then obviously she was pregnant, and then she was ten weeks premature, so she was in the hospital. And then I'm joining a new club, and it, and then I got injured, and yeah. it just it just fell apart so quick, very very quick. And I'm not going to lie, I take I take some of the blame. My attitude wasn't spot on because I was a lot of things my, going I had on. a lot of things going on in my head. And yeah, I was always one that if someone says something to me, I have to say something. So if the manager says something to me, I'm, I'm saying something back. Or if someone's got a problem, I'm saying something back. Yeah. Like if I felt it was wrong, like I remember. At Spurs, I started off quite well. I played played the first couple of games. Yeah. Uh, Santini got then got sacked. Then how, long, I got, how long was he? How long was he there for before he got sacked? Uh, no, he he joined a couple of weeks before me, and then he got sacked after three or four months. Okay. So I played under him most of the games, and then then I got injured, and then when I was coming back from injury, Martin Yol was the manager. And then I'd come back from injury expecting to train with the first team and then I'd be training with Clive Allen. And I'd be thinking, why am I training with the kids? Like, I'm like 24, 25, yeah. I should be. So, I, and instead of going, just being having an honest conversation, I thought, no, that's, I, I started sulking. So then I'm training with the kids. So for instance, this is this is what made me vex. I, I'm, so when, you, when you're a footballer, you go out, you stand around like you wait for the manager to come out. So I'm standing next to Robbie Keane and Michael Carrick. Yeah. Uh, Clive Allen is, I'd say, 300 yards on the on a third pitch over with four, with five or six of the the not the youth team, the, the under twenty threes. Martin Yo's to my left. I go to the boys. Watch this. Martin Yo walks past me, walks 300 yards that way, walks back, walks past me again, and goes, "Come on, we're going, lads." And as I'm going to go in. Clive Allen whistles over, Sean, you're training with me. So in my head, I'm thinking, you just walk past me, walk 300 yards there, walk back, walk past me again, and you can't have the balls to tell me you're not training with the first team. So in my head, a young kid from Baxi, I'm thinking, now you're a pussy. Yeah, and you're taking the piss out of me. You're taking the piss out of me. You're mugging me off. You're, you're treating me like an idiot. Yeah. Okay, all right, see what happens. So I went over there, and not going to lie, I tossed the training session off, didn't run, didn't do anything properly. That was my mistake. Yeah. Because now, if I'm if I'm a mentor for someone else, I'm saying, get on with it. Go be a model pro. That, yeah. that was my mistake, and then I'd end up doing things that I'm, like we were doing crossing and shooting with Clive Allen with no goalkeepers. 
And I'm looking, thinking, what am I doing here? I just, I was a first team player at Fulham. I'm coming to Tottenham and you, you haven't even told me if you can, if you, if you were to turn around to me and say, I don't rate you, you're not in my plans. Try and find it. Oh, they held my hands up. We had, he didn't say a word. Wouldn't, wouldn't, I wouldn't have said a word and then from then on it went downhill because I remember we played Grimsby in the cup so the, the reserve team I play you know in the Carling yeah. Cup I was on the bench and it was my birthday as well I'm on the <coughs> bench nil nil at the time come on after 70 minutes yeah I'm near post at a corner corner comes in I head it clear outside the box the guy volleys it back into the top corner we lose one nil come back in blame me for the header Thinking, what, saying it wasn't good enough. Yeah, 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 I'm thinking, all right, then it's my birthday as well. I'm on the bench for the for the bomb squad. You're blaming me for the goal. So I get get back to it was obviously Grimsby away. It's late at night. Get yeah. back to the hotel. Stayed at the the Regents Regents Hotel. It's like literally two minutes from the training ground. Because yeah. I said I can't. There's no point driving home to a training in the morning. So I get, I get to the. Uh, oh, you booked your own hotel. I booked a hotel. Yeah, yeah. Uh, booked the hotel. So I get in. I get to the bar. It's my birthday. I went, Do you know what? I'm going to have a drink. Nothing, man. I'm going to have a Smirnoff ice. And if you know what Smirnoff ice is, it's not even a drink, is it? It's like lemonade. I'll go in and I'll have a fag as well. So I'm sitting at the bar <laughs> with a Smirnoff are, ice <laughs> and a <laughs> gold Benson and Hedges thinking, I'm just going to, and talking to the barman, all of a sudden I'm facing the bar. So he goes, put it away, put it away. I went, what do you mean? What do you mean? Damien Camoli walks in. He's, he's the director, director of football. Yeah. I'm going, fuck that. I said, fuck that. I'm not putting it away. So he comes, stand, go, what are you doing? What are you doing? I went, listen, don't, don't start. We have a conversation. He went, no, no, what are you doing? I went, listen, it's my birthday. Uh, he storms off, goes up to the room. Next day, going to training. He pulls me in the room with Martin Yol. To be fair, I explained the situation. Martin Yol didn't like confrontation anyway yeah. Martin Yol used to see me Turn. and w as we were walking get on his phone or head down yeah one like of those that, ones yeah. so I knew he wasn't going to come at me I knew but it, the writing was on the wall from then the right he was yeah so Spurs but, yeah it was fin finished <laughs> but how how did it feel when the players are playing your position you mentioned them earlier the J uh, Jermaine yeah. Jenis Edgar David they're coming in and playing in your position and they're like David's big name, Janice, young lad coming through. You, you're just in limbo. Like, how are you feeling when this is all happening? And they've paid for yeah. you as well. Yeah, it's, it's basically, it's embarrassing. It's embarrassing. It's like, how can I explain it? It's like, ah, is he think like, these guys must think I'm dead, like rubbish. Yeah. So it's a bit embarrassing, but at the same time, I got on with, with most of the lads. So uh, all the lads are like, but then I didn't help myself. Like I was like, I love why I was too young and stupid to, I didn't have anyone telling me, oh, just get on with it. Like just concentrate, like stay. Cause I was half injured, half not injured. You know what I mean? And then I, I looking back now, I would have definitely concentrated more on myself. You know, and tell the other stupid boy to say, don't do stupid things. Yeah. Like, behave yourself. Like, I, I, don't get me wrong. It's a fifth, for me, looking at it now, if I would have done that, then it wouldn't have probably been a problem. And I might have got back in the team. So I was betting some of the players there, I think. Yeah. I mean, Michael Brown played played for Spurs while he was there. And I, 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 in my opinion, I'm a better player than him. Uh, don't get me wrong. Michael Carrick's probably the most underrated player in in Premiership history because he was unbelievable. Yeah. So I had no qualms with that. But Edgar Davies wasn't Edgar Davies wasn't the Edgar Davies of before. Yeah, Jermaine Genesis is a good player as well. But listen, if if you're gonna, I felt I could have played, but I didn't give myself the chance to play. Yeah. So eventually, I had to move to uh, to Portsmouth. But Pedro Mendes was there. He was there as well. Couldn't get in the team. So I'm thinking he can't get in the team as well. And Pedro Mendes was a baller. Yeah. Um, while you're still at Tottenham, like you first you mentioned your, your injury, are you actually injured or are you one of them players that like managers not feeling young to toss it off and pretend I'm injured and stuff like that? Ten, ten operations on my knee, mate. Oh. I, 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 ne I well, I never pulled a hamstring because I wasn't quick enough. Never really pulled a muscle. <laughs> like I broke a toe once, was out for six weeks. Yeah. M 
I was one of those players that I played through the pain. So I used to train on a bad knee all the time. I remember, see, this is what makes me laugh as well at Tottenham because the first season I was there, obviously I got injured, not, but I was playing towards the back end of the season and they were telling me, listen, just have this injection, get you through the game, you know, and then come back next season yeah. stronger. So I was doing all that, but I'm having these injections that in the long runs, kill killing it, it's just sweeping the, yeah. it under the carpet. Yeah. So it makes the injury worse. But and then to make all matters worse, I'll come back for pre-season. I'm not even traveling with the first team. So I sacrificed all that for what? Yeah, it's killing And people me, don't yeah. see this in football. Because there's no there's no loyalty in football either way nowadays no no chance because you I did I should I should have just said no no I'm not doing that I'm injured I'm gonna get back but I wanted to play football yeah I play I play injured because I the adrenaline gets you through it I guess but then after the game you're like oh wow I can't yeah. move my knee I guess also you're trying to prove a point to the manager like get me back in the team like I'm actually good enough so I'll play injured and show and show you that da, 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 da. but then. You're just killing yeah, yourself. 100%. Yeah, hundred percent. And then I ended up making things worse for myself in regards to my knee. Yeah. And I was plagued by my knee the whole time. The whole three and a half years I was at Portsmouth, my knee was killing me. Let's go to Portsmouth now. Actually, sorry. Let's go back to Tottenham. Like I like I said before, there's always a story, like a funny story. And you've got a good yeah. changing room at, at Spurs. There was a great bunch of lads. But the, the problem is with that, see, I still lived in Wimbledon at the time so I was driving two hours to get to training and two hours back wow. each day but I weren't driving and my mate was out of work at the time yeah so you're paying him so I was paying him so I didn't really have that much going out with the and you got your little girl yeah at the time so Tottenham was a difficult period for me it was like the, uh, you know what the, the story that I've got was probably when I first joined we went on pre-season and I just got back <laughs> In the holidays, I was in Iron Apple. And I went Iron Apple five, six years in a row. So like, yeah. that's, how, that's how I first knew Robbie King because I used to see him out in Iron Apple. And yeah. literally, it was a foot footballer's paradise back there. Like wherever you went in Iron Apple, it, it was a footballer. Be, yeah, it was all footballers. So I knew some of the players from there. So they all knew me as, ah, oh, Sean's having a lot. Like, when I'm having out, I'm having a drink. I'm, having, I'm like, having a so, fag. Yeah, well. yeah. Well, not so much the fags, <laughs> but yeah. I, I, I'll tell the truth. So I had to tell the whole story. I did have a fact. In it. <laughs> so I, I'm on pre-season now. We're away in Austria. We're in a restaurant. Someone gives me a red wine and I neck it in one thinking, yeah. Sick and it. everyone's like, absolutely. Sick everyone's it. laughing, but it was kind of me trying to get to know everyone. Yeah. Oh yeah. Sean's all right. Oh. Yeah. So it was a bit of nerves. Don't get me wrong. So I bang it. Next one comes bang. Listen, after about six, I can't remember hardly six anything. Six straight shots. Yeah, yeah, six, six, six glasses of red wine. My teeth are red, everything. Everyone was laughing. All I can remember <laughs> is walking back to the hotel, thinking, I don't know where I am. I think one of the young lads come out and went, quick, quick, Mark Yates it was at the time. He was a baller. He was one of the young lads. He saw me and he thought, oh my God, you're a mess. Took me to my room and I woke up the next day, oh my God, I had the worst, you know, one of those hangovers thinking, I can't train today, I can't train. I'm, I'm in. So I went to the doctor, but I knew the doctor from like Fulham day, so yeah. I went, oh, my knee's hurting me, my knee's hurting me. But she knew, <laughs> she knew, Yeah. she knew. She knew what I meant. couldn't train, I couldn't train. And then when I saw the lads at lunch, they were like, oh my God. They said I tried to walk and sit into a, in a police car. They said I was just dancing on tables and chairs. And I can't remember, I just must have just blacked out. Must have just blacked out. Is this your first season at Spurs? First pre-season, yeah. Pre so three, four weeks into my career at Tottenham. And just showing yourself up. <laughs> to be fair, I don't think any of the coaching staff found out. So that's one fair blessing. Play. Yeah, that's fair one blessing. Play. But yeah, that was a mess. I, to be fair, I don't even drink red wine after that. What What did it... <laughs> <laughs> that, I wouldn't that or Stella I don't drink Stella after wife wife, watching Marvin Elliott's performance against Man United Mill in the cup final he reduced me to Stella sorry Marv sorry Marv <laughs> um, what are the initiations like? Uh, do you know what I can't remember there being too much. I remember when I went on loan to Bristol City they used to have to sing a song and that but the initiations there wasn't really a initiations back then. Well, your initiations neck in six yeah, but That was just me out and just trying to make myself feel comfortable. That that was just me doing that. But yeah. 
initiations no i think the game's changed now anyway isn't it it's like back then there was no social media the team used to win lose or draw together we always used to go out together whether it be restaurant club bar yeah. whatever nowadays players can't do that it's, they're so much stricter which is probably a good thing for them because longevity because i do believe that media kill them go, going out and drinking only has a bad effect on your career any, yeah. at some point so it's, it's they're, they're blessed in that but initiations no nah, there wasn't when i was it wasn't so they probably did the initiation because they don't have any fun they're probably making That's, people yeah. sing and stuff like that but we no it, there wasn't any at the clubs i was at there wasn't hardly any initiations you take them out and get them drunk <laughs> and have a laugh but you love that and see what see what type of person they are but yeah it's most of most of the clubs i was at they didn't really have those fair enough um Portsmouth come, you think, you believe that's like a saving grace. How did that move come about? Uh, it was, a there was three of us involved in the move. So it was, it was me, Pedro Menes and Noé Paramo, a French lad that was at Tottenham at the time as well. It nearly fell through because I don't think Noé was going to sign for some reason. Oh, right? so you all had to sign together yeah, for it Yeah, it was a free, three-way deal for nine million or something for three okay. of us or something like that. Obviously, Harry had just taken over at Portsmouth. Harry Redknapp. Yeah, 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 just taken over at Portsmouth. So, and... Uh, What's he like as a manager? If you're playing and you're playing well, he's great. If you're not playing, don't really say much to you. So, it's one of those. Like, Harry's Harry, isn't it? Like, he... he if you're playing and you're doing well, it'll make you feel a million dollars. But if you're not playing well, then he won't really speak yeah. to you, to be honest. He's like, I remember going in the first two or three weeks, I'd, I'd done all right. Then I had a couple of bad games and then I probably didn't speak to him for another four or five months. It's one of those ones, do you know okay. what I mean? But I went there injured, but I got through it. I played well. But for me, I just never thought Harry really rated me. I didn't think he rated me as a player because whenever there was a big game, he would drop me. And for me, that tells me you, you're not yeah, really, not you're not, you're not, you don't trust me, and you're not rating me. But I played okay. I remember my best season at Portsmouth lasted from the start of the season, which is August to, to Christmas. I played, um, I was I was one of the best players. I was playing well. Team were flying. Then he signed Lesana Diara, Diara from Arsenal. Yeah. And I didn't get in the team. Do you feel at training, your is the competition's great. Like, there's no difference between you and him? Or is it just because he's nah, laying... listen, he was a baller. He was a player. I couldn't go and knock on his door and say, hey, put me in put me in instead of him because yeah. he, he came there and he was our best player. But my angle was, well, you're playing him and then you're playing Papa Diop and Sully Montari. They ain't playing great at the time. Get me in. It was like, so it was on the bench all the time, coming off and... Yeah, it was a frustrating period. It was probably one of the lows, obviously, getting to the cup final and then not even being on the bench. Let's talk that about that. That was a low. Uh, yeah, that was a big low. Let's talk about that cup final. So you're a part of the team that wins FA Cup, but you're not in the team. Yeah. There's stories going around that you weren't exactly sober. Oh, I was a wreck. A wreck. I, me I remember getting in the dressing room and him naming the team. I knew I weren't going to be in the team. And he named the bench. And I thought, I'm not even on the bench here. And in my head, I'm thinking, this is the cup final. Like, at least tell me the night before you're not yeah, going to play me. Yeah. But it is what it is. All right. I'm pissed now. What am I going to do? Went straight to the bar. At Wembley. At Wembley. Bad influence. Dragged a few of the young lads there. In your suit. In my suit. I remember doing the Caterpillar after the game on the pitch, actually. I was drunk. Uh, <laughs> just ordering everything, everything, everything. But in my head, I'm thinking... I've just got eight tickets. I've paid for eight tickets for all my family to come and watch the game. And you're not, you're not even in. I'm not even on the bench. I'm thinking, this is long. Like, I was just embarrassed. It was embarrassing. So I thought, what am I going to do? I'm embarrassed, bang, I'm going to have a drink. Like, it sounds like I'm an alcoholic. Well, I could have been, but I was good. We'll get it. to that. We'll get to that. But no, so I, yeah, I just took a few of the long nerds. And then with, and then a few of the other senior players thinking, ah. Oh, this is bad, man, because if they win, we knew they were going to win. They were playing, I can't remember, if Cardiff or West Brom, it was semi final. I can't remember who they were playing. That's how, how bad I think it was. It was Cardiff and you won 1 0. Yeah, Carnu scored. I remember that. But listen, I was thinking in my head, I need to get drunk because when they win, I need to be able to celebrate because I'm not going to, 
I want them to win. Yeah. I'm not one of those players. I'm not playing. Oh, they're, they're my boys. I, yeah. I, I used to love the team spirit at Portsmouth. I lo loved the lads. They were great. So how can I get as happy as them? So I might have tipped a few people outside of the football world that you should put some money on it and win some money for yourself. Yeah. If you know what I mean. <laughs> so that could have kind of worked in my favor. And obviously the rest is history. We won the game celebrating on the pitch steaming on the bench must have smelt like vodka or whatever it was we were drinking but no i was pleased to be honest because Portsmouth as a whole as a city and as a football club brilliant yeah, they're fans. i kind of likened it to fulham as it was a family club it was a community club everyone got on everyone mucked in we went to i signed for portsmouth we were cold showers we were in portal cabins but that's what i grew up like yeah it's so normal to you it was normal to yeah. me so and i think things like that build a team spirit and when i first went there we were bottom of the league and we our, our team spirit managed to keep us up and then obviously with the players that he signed some big names as well that he always signs yeah. you know grunkyard the foe crouch <laughs> but we had they were good lads uh glenn johnson uh soul campbell silver sylvan distan Herman Haridison, David James, uh, David James, yeah, uh, Papa Diop, uh, Sully Montari, Cronkia, Nugent, Utaka, uh, Crouchy, Defoe. That was a team. That was a, a good very, team. Very good team, yeah. Do you know what I mean? And we, I played in Europe with Portsmouth, so we'll get yeah. So Europa League, Europa League, UEFA Cup back then. What's that like? Are you, like, I think Buzzing. you're the first person I've spoken to that's played. Yeah, no, in but, the European tournament buzzing because i had a little bit i played with fulham in the, in, in the toto cup we won that and then we played in uh, played hamburg and a couple of other teams yeah. Bologna. in but that was the proper when i knew about it more and obviously we see then again as a life of a footballer one minute you're up one minute you're down we're playing in europe but we got ac milan we draw against ac milan yes we're playing at san siro but back then you only played one home or one it was either home or away yeah. and we had ac milan at fratton park and they've got the big boys they, oh yeah, they're the big. I'm on the bench though. Oh, okay, so at least I'm involved. I'm on the bench, but <laughs> we're two new up. I come on, and we draw two all. I'm thinking, no, nah, this ain't right. Nah. Even though nothing was my fault, I actually not made Clarence Seedorf. That's that's one of my claims to fame. <laughs> when I when I'm sitting in <laughs> my local you'll take bar, you take that with my other football mates. <laughs> obviously, I can name them: Jamie Lawrence, Barry Howes. I not I not make I not make Clarence Seedorf no look as well see you later <laughs> banged it 60 yards but then obviously they scored Inzaghi scored and then Ronaldinho scored free kick in the top corner sorry about that I know and, and David James blamed the wall as well he's banged the, slapped the, it top point it, top the ball bins. was moving all over all over the place <laughs> one minute it's Battersea Park Road then it's on the M25 <laughs> top corner bang David James blamed the wall I'm thinking nah sorry mate nah it's not having that but that's how he was a perfectionist though David James perfectionist uh, one of the best See, I would put him as the best goalkeeper I played with, even though I, I don't played think with Van der Sar. The critics will though. I, I just he was such a professional. Like, don't get me wrong, J Mo is yeah, like you could have a conversation with J Mo about anything. Like I get on with J Mo so well. We used to play cards at the back of the bus. I never used to drink coffee before I met J Mo, and then he's having like ten coffees before a game and I'm drinking coffee as well. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? A snooze as well. Got me, well no, Herman O'Reilly got me on the snooze, but no, James Jamo was a, was a good goalkeeper, top goalkeeper. Just gonna go back to um, your drunken moment at the FA Cup. Yeah, I heard your medal was stolen. You didn't even care. Yeah, my medal got stolen out of the hotel room. You ever get it back? No, nope, no, nope, never got it. But I didn't play, so don't count, does it? You can't. You can't. If you win, I, like people say, yeah, you. I, I was at Portsmouth when we won the FA Cup. Did I win the FA Cup? No, I didn't. Yeah. I didn't play in the final. I wasn't even on the bench. If I was on the bench and didn't get on, I still might say I, I didn't win it. If I get on for that one minute, yes, I, thought <laughs> I got on the pitch. But I contributed. I didn't contribute. You done the caterpillar, so I done the caterpillar. I still got the suit though. <laughs> maybe I can auction that off. Maybe, maybe. I'm pretty I, sure. Do you know what? It's a still. A, I've got the Portsmouth FA Cup final suit. So if anyone wants to make me an offer, times are hard. Kids need new <laughs> shoes and all that. <laughs> um. Portsmouth, did you, did you get relegated with them? No, I was I, I left the season. They got relegated. And then where did you go? I joined Bolton. Similar scenario to Tottenham. So Injured. I had four clubs in 
two of them were similar. Portsmouth, Fulham, family club, played well, got on, yeah. good team spirit. Tottenham got injured, in and out, bad attitude. Not so much bad attitude at Bolton. Bolton was more of a life lesson for me. I joined Bolton under Gary Mixon. Yeah. Uh, in pre-season, done a couple of runs in the park. Done my knee. Didn't tell no one. Knee swollen. I'm not going to tell no one. I've just signed. I can't can't have an operation and miss. Didn't tell no one. Playing training. My knee's the same size as Barry Football. House's head. It's massive. <laughs> my knees are blue. Had to put injections in my knee. Drain, drain. If you ever known it, they drain the fluid out, and it's like a it's like an oil change. They t drain all the fluid out and then put new fluid out. Just to that's it what is. I used to do. Yeah. Like. So I'll get through the first three or four games. I can't move, by the way. I turn in like a 137 bus. I'm awful. Like I, I play okay, but I'm so in my head, I'm thinking I can do so much more. Yeah. It's like when you get older, you know what you want to do with it, but you physically yeah. can't do it. That's how I was. And then my last game for Bolton, we played Liverpool at home with two one up. I get two yellow cards. Lucas runs in front of me. I get a second yellow card. I didn't even touch him. It goes down and gets sent off. After that, I said, you know what? I've got sent off. I need to fix my knee. Yeah. And then it just went downhill. Didn't, downhill from there. Didn't play again. Didn't play again for for, 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 for I've mo I basically moved up to Manchester because it's near Bolton. Yeah. What's that like though? So you've moved. Have you, have you moved your whole family? Moved my whole family up. So my, my stepdaughter, she moved. God bless her. She went to the local school around the corner. My little girl just started in primary school. She moved. Uh, my partner. Uh... And it was a lot to ask from them as well because we're moving up north. It's yeah. a lot different to South London. Like my my missus was at mixed race, so it's a bigger ask. Yeah. Because you don't know. Like you hear so many yeah. stories of, you know, is is there is it going to be a community that we can get involved with? Is there going to be other ethnic like yeah. urban families there? Don't know. So it's a big ask from her. So she committed to it. And to be honest, it just went downhill because I basically felt like I moved up there to stay in the house because I was injured all the time. Like it was horrible. It was like, it's the most lonely, boring, monotonous thing to, to be injured for. I was, uh, first injury, I was on crutches for 12 weeks. Then I, as soon as I tried to come back, it went again. And it's, it's just demoralizing. You're in the gym, you're not talking to the lad, you're getting in earlier than everyone else, you're leaving later. Best friend's the physio. Yeah, and I didn't get on with the physio because I thought he wasn't doing me justice. Yeah which later on I believe is the truth because I ended up having to leave football to go to UK athletics for them to take a look at my knee and give me the right things to do to, to be able to get out and train just to train. Wow. So, and that's weird because you look at football and you think how much money is in football Yeah. and you go to UK athletics and yeah. they just light years, they were light years ahead of the, the physios in football, light years. And it was, it was frightening because that's why I say it was a life lesson because I learned to know my body, what to, to put in. Because obviously you run it as a footballer, you can eat so much pasta. Um, what I need to eat, what I need to do to get fit, what I need to uh, go in the gym to do to be able to give myself the best chance to be able to train. So I learned all of that, but it was just too late. Mm -hmm. When the doctors are telling you right at the end, do you want to be able to run around in the garden with your daughter? You need to retire. So it was like, so fair enough. Forced early retirement. What's that playing on your head, like mentally? Like, yeah, it was. I knew it was coming. So in my last season at uh, at Bolton, I never forget. I was trying to come back, trying to come back. So I played in a reserve game. I was terrible. I'm not gonna lie. I was awful. Just couldn't move. Couldn't get close to all these young lads running around. And I remember sitting in the canteen with Nigel Rio Coker and Zach Knight, just just a bit down and deflated. And the chairman comes up to me. Guard side, guard side at the time, and he goes, "Oh, you are terrible." And in my head, I'm thinking, ten years ago, my God, I would have just, <laughs> lost my, head. I would have thrown my plate of food in his face ten years ago. I just kind of just sat there and just took it. Like, Did you know? I knew, and I, and then and then the other side of me is, well, to be fair, you're the chairman. You paid my wages yeah. for all this time, and I'm, but then I could say, well, if you had better physios, I might have been fit. So. I didn't want to go into that yeah, debate, yeah. but so many things go through my mind. And, and then to be, when he left, they both looked at me and went, I can't believe you just said that. And in my head, I'm thinking, I can't believe I didn't say nothing back to him. <laughs> yeah. And then that's how, that's how it went at, at Bolton. It was, it, was, it was embarrassing because I 
train and then you know at the end of training the, the Owen Coyle will go oh you two can go in now and we'll do pattern of play for the game what to uh, you to me and, then I, and I'm thinking like oh I'm some Joey I'm like I'm getting buoyed off but what can Basically I do? Basically a mannequin, isn't it? Yeah, I couldn't get fit enough. Like my knee, I couldn't run as hard and get fit on my knee to get me fit enough to play. Because I believe if I was fit, I would walk in that side all day long. Yeah. Not a problem. Not a problem. But that was the demoralizing. It's embarrassing. And you, you're training with the under 23s and you can't, you can't even train with the first team. It's, it's similar to Spurs again, but yeah. I'm a lot older. But, I'm not acting it out and acting like a big kid. I'm holding it in this time, which is probably worse for me. I'm holding it in and emotionally I'm all over the place. Yeah. What am I going to do? I'm a footballer. What else can I do? I can't even play football properly. And I'm I can't even do yeah. that. Now, now these young kids are thinking, right, these players are rubbish. It's dead. But as a footballer, the, the biggest thing you want to do is get recognition of the players you're playing with. Yeah. That's a big feeling. So for the, for you to not even train with them and then young kids come in and then they're going away on holiday, on tour and you're not even going, you're staying behind. Mate, it was eight weeks left. They got, they got, Bolton got relegated that season. I didn't play, but with eight weeks left, the manager rang me up and went, because I tried to go on loan to Bristol City. Yeah. Nah, awful. But I come back and he goes, oh, you might as well just take the rest of the time off. Normally people were like, yeah, you got eight weeks off, but I felt embarrassed by it. Like, all right, then. And that was my football career done. In a nutshell, done. Wow. It's not the way I wanted to go out, but it is what it is. Like I said, I am still playing now for a Vets team, so that gets me How's out. How's now? Playing wise, if I don't if I play once every four or five weeks, I'm all right. I'm all right. Vets team, it's like hot and cold. You can either get a good vets team where it pops or it's walking football. Yeah, no, we, we, our vets team are good. We've got a lot of ex pros playing and we only go into two cup competitions, the Surrey Cup and the National Cup. So, and I got the opportunity to play for, for the England vets last year. Okay. Uh, in Thailand, we got to the final and lost to Iran in the final 1 0, but that was an experience that, that, you know, that was good. Obviously, it got cancelled because of COVID yeah. this year, but hopefully it'll be on next year and I can try and get Are you myself sure enjoying it? fit. Mate, I love it. I, love, I, love, I more I miss the banter and the, the team spirit. Yeah. I, I miss that. Obviously, you miss playing, but I don't miss all the travelling and stuff like that, but I'll travel to Thailand to play in the World <laughs> Cup. That's not a problem. Um, so what are you up to now? Uh, well, when I finished playing, I've done a little bit of this, a little bit of that. So I've done a bit of coaching for Fulham Under 8s. Not for me. Done a bit of radio. My mates would say I've got a face for radio, but uh, don't oh, do that. Why is that pretty work? Because I'm ugly. They call me <laughs> ugly, yeah. Uh, so I then my, my power owns a football agency. So basically I've known him since, not knee high, but secondary school. So I kind of just <laughs> scout, look at players, try and give the young players a bit of advice, even though some I think the parents need more advice than the players. Uh and that's it, basically. Let's touch on that because I feel I do a bit of coaching as well. And I feel like when you hear parents talk on the side, it's them chasing a the dream more than the kids. Like, just yeah. let the kids play. But my son's here, my son's there. And you've got parents picking up their kids, taking them to Arsenal one day, Chelsea the next day, yeah. da, 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 having like McDonald's for dinner and stuff in the back of the car. Like, what would you say to a parent who thinks their son's the next best thing? <sighs> It's a difficult one because obviously I'm a parent, but I've got two girls. And I ask, I try and put my shoe on the other foot. If I had a boy, uh, would I allow my boy to go into academy at a young age? Probably not. I want my son to have fun and enjoy it. But when I mean a young age, I mean six, seven, eight. Yeah. I see these kids in academies. I think it's tough for a kid to last eight to 16 without the fun and, the foot, and falling out of love of the game. So... If I had a kid, I'd probably put him in the academy at 12, 13, even, maybe even later. But I've seen, obviously, doing the agency work, I've seen so many parents. You're right. This, they're trying to live through their, their kids. Do you know what I mean? It's, you sh shouldn't be like that. But, but the, the highlight is they know what's out there. The fame, the fortune, money. the money. Whereas as a parent, you just want your kid to, you know, be happy, you know, be healthy, uh, succeed in whatever they do. I just feel that there's so much out there nowadays and 
obviously there's so many cowboys out there and when i mean cowboys i mean agents that don't know the game and they're trying to make a quick buck off you so they will sell you sell you a dream and, and gas you up yeah but they won't actually know what it takes to become a professional footballer and they will get bad advice and in the end that kid will end up believing that hype and lose out on maybe a half decent career would you say there's a massive dif difference between ag agents from your day if there were agents or if people used agents to agents now? A hundred percent. There was only, real f I think, three or four companies when I was growing up. Uh, now anyone can be an agent. You could be an agent tomorrow if you want. My mum's 75. She could be an agent because there's no exam. There's no, there's no law. Uh, don't get me wrong. I think if you love football, be an agent, yeah, but know the game. Know what it takes to be a footballer. Don't be in it to make a quick buck. That's where people make the mistake. They try and make a quick buck off a player, end up giving them the wrong move or send, giving them the wrong advice. They might make that quick buck, but that's short money. Yeah. Do you know They're what I mean? They're killing their clients. Don't do it for the money. I think if you're doing it for the money, you always chase money. It never comes. I think if you do it for the love of the game and the passion and do it right and be honest which I think is hard. There's not many people. I was so lucky. I had so many good people when I was younger who were honest and did it. Did it. Maybe they did it to obviously for their own happiness, but they did it out of love. And it's different nowadays. You know what I mean? It's different. No disrespect. I, I found it that when I was a kid and I was an under eight coach, I wanted to put my arm around a kid and say, well, like, well done, you know, have, have fun and joke. We can't do that nowadays because yeah. of all the, I don't know, the stuff that, come the stuff that and, comes yeah. out with it, where some of these kids need to need a cuddle. They need to be told they're loved. Do you know what I mean? And we got that when I was younger. Maybe you got tough love as well, but we got that. You don't get that nowadays. There's too many people pri waiting for these kids to earn a quick buck. Then no matter what happens to the kid. Oh, you're going to move the kid from A to B because that's more money, but it's better to move him to A to, or stay where you are and then move later on or move to this club. It's less money, but he's going to play more. And if he plays more, he's going to get better. And if 100%. he gets better, he's going to earn more money. If you're good enough, you're always going to, yeah. cream always climbs to the top. But if you get bad advice, that sometimes is the saying don't work out because they end up believing their own hype. They, you're all right. For instance, if you're a footballer and you've got an agent, you're a footballer, footballer, and he moves you to this team because they're getting him more money, but this team don't play football. How is he going to get on in this team? So he's a centre midfielder. He's going short. Every time he goes short, they're banging it long. But that's how the manager plays. That's how the team plays. But he took him there, not worried about that, just because he's getting more of a signing on fee from that team. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? That's, for me, that's... But don't players have a say in this? Players have a say, but it all depends about the influence around them. It well, depends what kind of background they're coming from. Yeah. Uh, don't get me wrong. I'm a Southerner, but I tend to find that the Northerners are a bit more clued up than the Southerners. Be in, in Because they're just all about hard work and, you know, make yeah, sure it's just part of their DNA, you'd say. Yeah. And don't I don't blame it. You get so many of these young single mums out there who there isn't really a big father figure around their child. So if someone's coming and saying this and that and dangling hundreds of thousands of pounds around i don't blame them for taking it it's yeah. hard it's difficult but i just it just gripes on me it just gripes on me that they're so vulnerable vulnerable to this because i've had vulnerable people on me during my career not so much agents but financially so i know what it's like and it, it's, it leaves a bad taste in my mouth and what, what so what they would come like is it like people you know, not your exact friends, but people you know come up to you and asking you for money and stuff like that? No, not so much than that because I've still got the same kind of friends that I grew up with. There's only one or two that I don't talk to anymore. Okay. But the way I look at it, when I fall out with someone, I just say we just have a difference of opinion. I never slight them. I, there's only one real friend that I really, really miss and I'd love to get back to know him. Fair enough. We fell out, but we fell out because of a third party. Okay. And, but I'm talking about the financial advisors that prey on young kids. So it happened to me. I, I'm, I was a young kid and I joined, a, joined a, an agency, but everyone in the agency was a certain, certain uh, financial group. I can't name it because it's yeah. still in the courts today. It's quite fresh. So I'm a young kid. I see 
top player, top player, top player, top player, all older than me with this thing. Okay, I'm from a background. No, my mum, my mum, my mum and dad never had no money. My dad was a butcher. My mum was a dinner lady. My yeah. dad never owned his own. My dad got offered his own house to buy for twenty five grand. Couldn't afford it. Rented all his life. Never had a house until I bought my mum and dad a house. So I never had that background of people with money. So in my head, I'm thinking, nah, these are shrewd top guys, top players. I'm going to go with this. So I went with this firm. Not until I finished playing playing football, I'm thinking, where's all my money gone? Like, I've got my portfolio here. So I took my portfolio to someone else. That was like, uh, he went, no, this ain't right. I was like, what? He went, this ain't right. Boom, boom, boom. boom. He, he said six or seven things to me. And he said seven or eight players that are in the same position, but no one, as men, we don't talk, do we? So yeah. no one's telling, uh, I, if, if I'm randomly not going to tell you that, oh, I'm having problems with yeah. this. I'm, so you're both having the same problem. And it's basically that, yeah, this is a lie. This is a lie. The money that you say, it's not there no more. And now you owe this wow. person HMRC money. And that's how it worked out. That's why, that's why, that's why I said to you, I'd love to give these kids an opportunity to not learn from my mistakes. I'm not in it for the money. Yeah. I'm not going to go to your kid and think pounds, signs, because I know money don't make you happy anyway. Money is not happiness. So like it might be being rich can be lonely because all your friends that you grew up with don't have, the money. Don't have no money. Yeah. So you can't roll with them. But well, you can if they're two friends. You know what I mean, you yeah. can roll. But it's different. There's a there's change there. That's why I said. That's why I said these kids need to learn because I've been there. I've done it. I've I've had I've had HMRC turn up my house with brown letters. Me thinking I'm saving. I was never extravagant when I paid. Never got on private jets. Never never like gambled it all away. Never really. Uh, done expensive tables uptown don't get me wrong I used to do it but back in the day it was four or five hundred quid that's nothing to what like they, they were doing back and they buy expensive watches expensive cars yeah. i had a mini the mini a blue mini when i was at bolton is that, I mean? I, is that is that because of finances or just because you're just humble just cars are a waste of money like i said to you i grew up a lot when i was at bolton when you're injured and you've got so much time to think yeah you see What's around you? Who's bad around you? Who's good around you? Why are they around you? Uh, why are you wasting your money on this? Why are you wasting your money on that? Mm. So, did did you have the support from your friends when you was at when you was at your lows, like the Bolton times, the Tottenham times, uh, or was it just your family nah, support? Because I never said I kept it all to myself. I, I never. I'm, I'm one of these people. I wouldn't even. I w if I borrowed money off you. I'd be, my, I'd, scr I'd be scratching my skin until I paid you back. I never, I'd never owe no one nothing. Never asked for nothing. That's, that's how I got good. My dad never asked for nothing. It, like, the people, when I went, my family are great because my mum my and dad, my sister, they never asked nothing from me. And when, when I like that, I bought my sister a house, I bought them, they didn't ask for it. My dad didn't even want to, when I bought my mum and dad a house, my dad refused to leave back, see, that I'm not going. I wanted to stay in a rented place really eventually he moved yeah. and then obviously joined a golf club and retired and yeah, lived the right. good life yeah. that he deserved because don't get me wrong we we weren't rich but we weren't poor we always had food on the table we always had the color gas heater that we always used to sit in front yeah never had the mtv until i was 16 never had a mobile phone until i was 17 so we, i had a good good upbringing but money is just pff, it's, it's it's not nice no especially for me that that feeling of i didn't really splash it out try to save it and be sensible and then it i might as well have done that because it all got taken away because of bad investments and fraud and stuff like that how is this affecting you though as a person like you're oh. you're thinking you've got all this money or you've got this portfolio and then you get told nah that's not there brown envelopes are turning mm. up you admit you've got your kids your family your missus you're in this lovely house and that's you that could potentially go or did it go it did it did it my mum yeah it was it was it's a lonely place mate it's like what how can i all right this is this is how my life went after i played football so i retired from football 2012 moved back down south uh then started finding out well oh, where's my money going so that's one thing in my head so i got that to deal with yeah then my old man died i was like 
oh so no, bad. this is crazy. Like that, that, that. Then I spit out with my my missus, but I probably spit out with my missus because of what's happened to me, and I'm in a different space. Yeah. So I've gone from being a professional footballer, retiring in 2012 to 2016, back in the first flat I've got, sit, sitting there thinking, what do I do now? That is crazy feeling. Yeah. Like, but I'm always. I, the way I looked at it was like, I'm not going to tell no one because I don't want pity. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to see, oh, there's always someone else worse off than you. That's how I'm going to look at it. So I'll just get on. Thank, and thankfully my mate who has the agency yeah. helped me out. He helped me out. You don't know he helped me out, but he did by yeah. giving me a job and giving me a bit of you know it, freedom. It keeps you sane as well because yes. you could have been sitting in that sitting in that flat and just got on the bottle. Oh, this as a footballer, all my life I've been told what to do, where to be, what to eat, how to dress. Remember, I come for breakfast, 8.30, yeah. games, trainings at 10.30, go in the gym at this time, eat this, eat that, report to this, report to that. Wear this. Very wear regiment. That, yeah. It's like the army, but not as, obviously, I'm not comparing footballers to the army because yeah. that's a joke, but it's very regiment like that. So then to come out of that, to go, hold on a minute, what do I do now? No one's telling me what to do. It sounds, you look, you might, people might look at me and think, this guy's dumb, like, why is he? But it's true, you miss that. You miss that structure. So then to come back and work and have that purpose, to have a, if you don't got a purpose or you don't got a passion about something, you're going to struggle. That's what I tell footballers now, play as long as you can and find another passion. What do you want to do? Whether you want to do a podcast or you want to own a trainer shop or you want to own a yeah. restaurant. Do something that when you stop playing, you can focus on. Because if you don't, you're going to end up, like you said, either going out, drinking, or staying in and being a recluse and not speaking to no one. And, but that's life though, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It is. And it, it doesn't surprise me. There's been a lot a lot of people, a lot of footballers, I'm not comparing the army, but a lot of army, they, could, they commit suicide because they can't handle that aftermath of, what do I do now? Post remember men's suicide is one of the highest. highest yeah it's one of the highest and it's the least spoken about exactly and i see i'm I'm old school whereas when they say oh, i need to talk about it you do need to talk about it because if you don't you either bottle it up and then you bottle it up and then you on. either i'm not con confrontation i don't i'm never but i reckon if i bottled it bottled it boiled it up one day someone's gonna get it mm. in like if it comes out or or you cry or or you have an argument with someone so it's, it's not healthy tool mm. boy <sighs> it, you're saying all the right things like it's, it's mad that no one knows it all of this stuff like like you say men don't speak mm. but you do need to speak and thank you for opening up um just to liven up the mood let's uh, let's have some funny stories football is when you was at your heights you probably earned more money than you probably ever thought you'd ever see yeah, 100%. how did you enjoy yourself like holidays gambling you, you must have touched vegas i went to vegas uh but not until the back end like i said I, I, all my younger days were either iron Napa, so uh growing up obviously i grew up in battersea so obviously battersea so solid crew yeah. so i was big big into garage yeah obviously growing up battersea sports and r sugar ray beautiful I'm yeah. Bashman and Barry's <laughs> Hammond. So I know all the music. So yeah. I either go to uh, Iron Up, and then when you're older, then you end up going to Marbella. Yeah. Then you obviously, I've been to Caribbean, Barbados. I love, you know, I've never been to Jamaica. I was supposed to be going, but obviously with the COVID, Locked it was up. supposed to be my mate's 50th and we were supposed to go there. But but yeah, Iron Up was good. I, I remember going to Iron Up one year and we had pre-season training at nine in the morning. And I was in Iron Appa and I got back into Gatwick at 5.36 and I'm steaming on the train. So on the plane, drinking vodka Red Bull. <laughs> Let me drink Red Bull because it's going to give me energy. It's going to give me give wings. Vodka I need taste. Get back to training. And then I thought, walking through the door and I saw Barry Howes that night, Elvis Hammond, they were all laughing at me. I was thinking, oh, mate. He went, do you know what we got, we're doing today? I went, what are we doing? He went, the bleep test. Shut you're a footballer, you're not the bleep test. Yes. I was like, oh no. But uh, who won it? I you. won it. 
Yeah. Red finish Bull, the tape. Red Bull, finish yeah. the tape. <laughs> but I was fit back then. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Those are the things, those are silly things I used to do. And in my head now, I think, why did I do that? I live my life. Don't get me wrong. Why did I do that? Oh, is that the reason why I got a bad knee? Is alcohol not good for you, is it? Yeah. So I always, but I did enjoy myself. I'm not going to lie. I ne Vegas, I've never really done Vegas. I've been to Vegas once. So I don't, I don't mind the casino. To be fair, when we was at Portsmouth, we used to go to the casino. We all used to play blackjack. So that was good. Like literally on a Tuesday, we'd have Wednesday off. Yeah. We'll fly down, down, go to the casino, get the table, high five on each other around <laughs> the table and that. But the best story at Portsmouth is the one where it's a Tuesday and someone come up with the idea of everyone get fancy dress. And it was all right, we'll wear fancy dress out. And then it went from, no, nah, don't tell no one what you're wearing, put it in a black bag. So, okay. So we left the training ground in Portsmouth and we drove to a pub in Oxshot. Yeah. Uh, it's off the A3. Yeah. There's a pub. Yeah, yeah. Just off the nice, it's a random little pub in the middle of nowhere. So you've got 10 or 12 premiership footballers from Portsmouth in this pub in normal tracksuits with black bags. So we say, oh, how are we going to do this? All right, we play cards. So we play 21. Yeah. Whoever loses has to go in the toilet, with a get changed bag. into their fancy dress, come back out and sit down while we're drinking, by the way. <laughs> so like first one loses, I think it was, uh, I don't know, it might have been Crouchy. So Peter Crouch walks into the toilet, comes back out and he's one of these these costume ones, you know, have you seen the costume where it's like a headless person holding the head yeah, here yeah, yeah. and that's his head. Yeah. So it's like, well, in the front, his head must have been like touching yeah, the yeah, seat. So it's the funniest thing you can see. But Crouchy as a lad was probably one of the best, most humble, greatest lads ever. I loved the laugh and the joke. Serious when he played football, great player. But just imagine him sitting there in the middle of a pub. Then someone else, Glenn Johnson might go in or then I go in, I'd come in, I'd come out as Catwoman. They're all laughing their heads off. <laughs> Jermaine Pennant's there, comes in, comes out as a gingerbread man. So you've got <laughs> yeah. all these professional players thinking nowadays that wouldn't happen, would it? Nah. Social media would go snap, snap, snap. It would be like, if we were doing bad at the time, it'd be, oh, look, they don't care about the bar. But it was just young lads having a laugh. You've got a day off the next day, having a drink, enjoying yourselves. How can you enjoy yourself? Obviously, it's a bit random with the fancy dress, but... Well, it's a laugh, isn't it? you got... Jermaine Pennant coming out of the pub singing, you can't catch me. I'm the gingerbread man. Do <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? It's crazy. Crazy. But no, they were, they were good times. Like I said to you before, that Portsmouth dressing room was good. It had a good bunch of, you know, young English players, uh, older professional players, some, some great foreign players as well that just got, got in, got stuck in and good manager. Yeah. No, listen, Harry, Harry was a good manager. He was a good manager. He got the best out of players. He knew he he didn't overcomplicate things. I think some days managers just overcomplicate things, and you know he just got good players and played them. And like I say, his record at Portsmouth speaks for itself. Yeah, it does. Um, just going to end on what advice you'd give the players. I know you've given a lot of advice. Yeah. But what advice would you give the younger players coming up? simple really i think in football is a, a, is a roller coaster of emotion so if you can get grounded as in if you play if you play well don't get too high and if you play bad don't get too too down so you can get get that middle ground and day to day you, like i say to the players all you can concentrate on is what you can do not oh this team we're playing rubbish why is the manager playing here why am i doing this all you can do is go into training and work on you. Yeah. You can't control. Don't you can't control anything else. All you control, if you can go in, do your gym work. How can I improve today? How can I improve today? Like I say, because the harder you work during the week, the easier it is on a Saturday. So it's about that. That meant that talent is ten percent in football. The rest, the rest of it is up here, because you could play one game one week and score a hat trick next week you get sent off or you get, you go, you make a mistake and then you're the bad man. Yeah. For instance, Deli Ali, he's was the best thing since I spread. Now I can't even get the Tottenham yeah. team. I'm not, I don't know what's going on there, but that's how I'm just showing you how football can change. One minute it can be here. One minute it can be there, but all you can control is yourself. So if you can control your, your head and your day to day stuff, that's what you can do. And that is simple, but it's effective because if you start thinking you're too good or 
you start getting down, you're not going to perform. Yeah. That comes from having the right people around you as well, because exactly. you don't want the ego boosters. And exactly. And I think these young people and these young agents sometimes, and these mums and dads, you're overthinking it. You, you, if the manager plays him there, you play there. If the manager tells you to pick that up, you pick that up. No, none of this ego, Rob. If the manager tells you to, because at the end of the day, if the manager don't trust you and you don't believe in you, you're not going to play, you know how good you are. You're not going to play. No way in a million years. If he doesn't trust you to go away on a Tuesday night to Burnley or to Mansfield or to Rochester on a Tuesday night when it's freezing cold up north, if he doesn't trust you, you're not going to play. Yeah. Can you take instructions? Can you take what he wants on board? It's not talents, 10%. Because growing up, I was one, I wasn't even the best player I've got growing up. In my Sunday, in my Sunday team, I had Julian Gray, Gary Alexander. They were better than me. In school, I had Byron Glasgow. He was 10 times better than me. At Sports Centre, I had five, six players that were better than me. A guy called Shamak, Luke Cornwall. They were all better than me. Why did I make it? I got a bit lucky, but I knew when to get my head down. I knew when to work hard. Don't get me wrong, I might took my foot off the pedal once once I achieved a certain amount. I might have took my foot off the pedal, but I was able to get that. I think I earned the right. Maybe it was the wrong thing, but I earned the right. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. But I wasn't the best. Nowhere, nowhere, nowhere near it. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank My you. pleasure. All right. Um, just to round up the pod, um, great episode. Just going to finish on a quick fire round. Yeah. Yep, let's go for go? it. All right. Cool. Um, best player you've played with? Played with, uh, I would say Louis Sahar. Best manager? Uh, Jean Tigana. Best stadium you've played in? Oh, wow. Uh, uh, home, I'd always love playing at the cottage, but away, uh, I did love Celtic's ground. It was a good stadium, good atmosphere. Um, worst manager? Worst manager for me was probably Owen Coyle. Player most the player you thought was most likely to be a manager? Uh Lee Clark. Uh change room clown. Normally it was me, uh, but there's been a few clowns. Uh <laughs> yeah, I've probably been the biggest clown at most, if I'm honest. Mark Wilson was a bit of a clown at Portsmouth. Uh Crouchy was a joker. Yeah, Crouchy was a big joker. Not a clown though. Best atmosphere. Best atmosphere was in the stadium or in the dressing room? Go both. Okay. Uh, best dressing room. There's two. I'd say the year we got promoted for Fulham and the, the Portsmouth team. That was two. The Portsmouth team that we had, Crouch, Johnson, uh, David James. That was a great atmosphere. Uh, Fratton Park on a, on, a, on a Friday night was always electric. Uh, always a great atmosphere there. AC Milan game. AC Milan was a great game in, in uh, atmosphere wise. Maybe uh, not so much in a result. But so I just realised you was in the wall for the Ronaldinho free kick. So you're yeah. probably to blame for that. Listen, I was in the wall for the Ronaldo kick against Portsmouth. Remember that free kick? All you people listen to oh, this. Yes. Listen to this podcast, yeah, because I know millions <laughs> are, and if you don't, you're idiots. So watch the Man United Portsmouth at Old Trafford. Wall. The first time he done. The first time the ball moved everywhere. David James. We all in the wall looked at each other and started laughing. That's how good it was. It was unbelievable. Wow. Bang! I've never seen anything like that in my life. Never. Amazing. Um, most money you spent on a night out? Oh wow! Uh, I got stitched up once. We was in Dubai with the Portsmouth team. And we, were, we ordered a table and uh, what we used to do is put all our credit cards in a bag and whoever the waitress pulled out had to pay for it. I think Crouchy's got pulled out, but something happened and he, his card didn't work or something. Didn't so decline, did it? I don't know what happened. I don't think so. Not with, not with his dough, but, and then he pulled out mine. I think it was about, I think it was about eight or nine, 10, 10 grand or something like that. I can't remember, which was, to me, it was a big hit. It was a big hit, which is disappointing. But we used to do that all the time. If we went to restaurants, whoever the waitress pulled card out had to pay for it. I didn't lose too many times, but that was probably the, that was the worst time to lose it. Yeah, I definitely went bed fuming. 
And I think I would have come out the next day. The worst thing is it was the end of the night. So you don't really realize yeah. until the next morning and you probably get a, a, a phone call or a message from Barkley saying your card's been, been stopped. <laughs> also some, some suspicious, uh, activity. activity. Yeah. That's the word. Um, if you wasn't a footballer, what would you have been? Do you know what? When I was in the youth team, we said if we weren't get pro contracts, we would have been postman. So I probably would have been a postman or something. I, I don't think I would have been a PE teacher because I don't like little kids. <laughs> They're just annoying. I don't even like my own nephews. They're annoying. Uh, so probably a postman because you get up, you're out, and you're home yeah, by yeah. 12.30. So good. Most memorable moment in football? Uh, probably pers on a personal note, scoring scoring a winning goal for Fulham against Blackburn that kind of sealed us promotion. And then the following week, scored the goal that won us the title. So that was probably the proudest, proudest moments in football as an individual. And then same as Fulham, looking back in, when you, fin when you finish playing, you look back and what did you actually achieve? What did you actually contribute? And I was part of the, the Fulham team that got them back into the Premiership after so many years. So that's a proud moment in, uh, proud moment in my career. Probably the proudest moment I've always probably, it's not football related, but football allowed me to, to buy my mum and dad a house. So that's probably the biggest thing I've ever achieved. That's decent. And biggest regret? Biggest regret. Oh, I hate saying this, but it probably be leaving Fulham for Tottenham. But it, it's a regret, but it isn't, if you know yeah, what I mean. I, but obviously, if I could change it, I would, I would definitely have changed that. Yeah. Sorry, Tottenham fans, but <laughs> it's just the way it is. Thank you very much. God bless. Cheers. No worries, bro.